Hi, I'm Mark Vernarelli and welcome to Inside Harford County, a program where we sit down with our community leaders and discuss the issues important to the citizens of Harford County. Monday, November 4th, and we're airing tonight live from the Harford TV studio. And this month, we're going behind the scenes of the thoroughbred horse racing and breeding industry through the eyes of a Harford County farm been in the business for almost 100 years. Sent a country life farm in Bel Air, and joining us tonight are County Executive Bob Castley and Josh Pons, the co-owner of Country Life Farm. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for being here tonight. And Josh, you just told me something that blows me away. We're sitting at the very spot where there was once a horse farm. So when we don't, we don't often think of Harford County with the horse uh, industry, but there were a lot of horse farms here at one time, and yours is still going, and congratulations. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Great to have you. Yeah. Sir, what's your perspective on the, the horse industry? We well, don't think much about it maybe day-to-day, sure. -day, but it's big. Yeah, I mean, look, historically, it's such been such a key part of Hartford County's history. With I mean, One time we had three three racetracks in Havity Grace and, and, and <coughs> one in uh, Bel Air, plus all the, the, the practice tracks and stuff. But we, <coughs> we've... Uh, done very well by it. It's an important industry to, to Hartford County, both you know the breeding and the racing both. And uh, uh, I just am really happy to be able to, to bring Josh in here because there's nobody knows this industry better than the Pons family who's been in it, as you say, for 100 years here in Hartford County. So. And Josh, probably fair to say that most of us common citizens, so to speak, we know nothing about the horse industry. Your family's been in it almost 100 years. What's the, the brief big picture of, of what you do out there and how you operate? Well, we, we run a thoroughbred nursery. We deliver 50 to 70 foals every year. We stand three stallions. We have uh, uh, 100 acres located two miles south of Bel Air on Lake Fanny Hill. It's been there longer than we've been there. 1933 was when my grandfather bought it, but the, uh, the farm itself was called Rockland and the Lee family, a very historic family, married into the Amos family. And as, they, as their kids needed land and farms, they, uh, they parceled off country life um, from, from the Amos clan. And you have, aside from the special talk about the horses, we'll save that for a minute, you have an interesting house there, too. We're going to visit the house a little later in the program, actually go up in the attic there. But talk about the history of the house. Well, my, my grandfather was a, uh, he was a, a, a personal secretary to a, a really rich guy in New York named August Belmont. And I think he knew a good house when he saw it. Belmont had mansions on Fifth Avenue and in Newport, Rhode Island and out in, on Long Island. And so when Grandfather was looking for farms in the middle of the Depression in 1933, there were dozens and dozens of farms and this farmhouse was in good shape and it was, importantly, it was close to um, Aberdeen where the train he could hop the train and get back to his clients in New York. But I think what sealed the deal was this beautiful old manor house on the farm, and he had to do a lot of improvements to the farm itself. He put up a lot of fences and built barns and things, but um, primarily it was this beautiful old house, which is still there, and we take good care of it. We paid a visit to the farm recently, and Josh's brother Mike actually gave us a little walking tour and talks a little bit about the history and economic impact of the industry. The state of Maryland, we've been breeding and racing horses here for more than 400 years. Uh, George Washington came to Annapolis to go to the races here. Uh, Andrew Jackson, other presidents, you know, came here to go to the races. Uh, so we have that great heritage here in Maryland that few states have. Uh, Kentucky was just prairie then, uh, but Maryland, Virginia, uh, New Jersey, this whole East Coast was the epicenter of Maryland, of thoroughbred racing and breeding in the United States. Well, the reason the industry took root here, uh, racing went wherever the English went, all over the world. Racing is an international currency, if you will. Uh, horse racing and breeding is done in every continent, short of South uh, Antarctica. Uh, wherever the British sailed, they took racing and the sport of racing with them. Um, and that started here, you know, very early. And you had the natural uh, the beautiful climate here, very similar to England in some ways, and it just flourished and it has done so ever since then. The economic impact of the horse business is pretty big here in the Mid-Atlantic. 
you know, for a farm like me, we have dozens of vendors, feed men, hay men, blacksmiths, uh, veterinarians, attorneys, accountants, and then all the agricultural folks, you know, the guys that seed and fertilize and all my workers, there's a lot going on. I think we have a multiplier somewhere around five or six for every one dollar we spend, but it gets churned and rechurned throughout the whole uh, economic system here. Um, right now, it's a very interesting time for Maryland racing and breeding. Uh, the state is the, through the Maryland Stadium Authority, is going to rebuild Pimlico. This is a $400 million uh, investment in the state in our sport. Uh, Pimlico will be the site of Maryland racing year round, uh, not just the Preakness in the spring. Uh, there'll be a, a separate training center where somewhere between 750 and 800 horses will train daily. They haven't decided on that site yet, but they've already taken a bunch of the barns down at Pimlico. Next year will be the 150th Preakness and they're gonna race on site with the keeping the current state point of stakes barns and the grandstand and uh, clubhouse intact. Then after the running, they're gonna bring that down. So, and I heard yesterday, they're gonna keep the actual surface that we've raced on all these years intact, which that's where all the track records were set. You know, Secretariat set track records 50 years ago that haven't been touched since, and to leave that for the for the traditionalists like you know the Pons family and other folks who breed and race here, uh, that's a big win for us. You know, history is what we're all about, and we need to run with it, not from it. And that's what too many other sports do wrong. I think. I think it's so beautiful that we have uh, real farms. You know, we talk about farm system in baseball. It's baloney. We have grass and dirt and manure, and we're out there with pitchforks every day. Uh, so we're, we're hard at it, and we take that very seriously. The green spaces in Maryland that you see, some of the most beautiful ones, you know, the Green Spring Valley, the Long Green Valley, uh, Darlington, uh, there's areas in Chesapeake City, there's huge blocks of preserved farmland. And uh, some of the prettiest land in the state are horse farms. What's fun is that uh, uh, horse racing combines so many different elements. There's the history, and then there's the pageantry, and there's the sport, and the athleticism of the horses and the jockeys. Uh, so much goes into putting on the show, if you will, that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. So when you come to the farms, you get to peek behind the curtain, and you'll get to see you know, where the horses are raised and, and how they are tended for. Um, my horses get some of the best care <laughs> known, you know, and, and they thrive because of that. The horses are very smart. Uh, I, tell, I tease everyone, the horses train the people. You know, what time do we eat? Well, we're hungry in the morning. What time do we go out? When I say so, what time do we come in? When I'm at the gate. The horses have it all, life's all figured out, and our job's not to screw it up. Well, that's a fascinating, it's a fascinating industry. And County Executive Castley, uh, you heard the $5 for every dollar that yes. comes in. So eventually it trickles down to, the, to a lot of other businesses. Yes. Yeah, good, that's a pretty good multiplier, five to one. Now, that's when we went out to the uh, farm recently, Josh was kind enough to give us a little bit of a walking tour and tell us about what it's like in the day, a day in the life of a stallion. All right, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a day in the life of a thoroughbred stallion. We turn them out first thing in the morning, about 7 o'clock, 7.30. They're out in weather like this. They're out all day till about 3 or 3.30. Uh, this is not our breeding season. Uh, the breeding season stretches from February to about the middle of June. And um, the stallions during breeding season have a different routine. But here in the fall, they're just enjoying life and being turned out and just being horses but they can only be horses by themselves. Uh, you can't turn a stallion out with another horse. Um, they're, they're territorial. And so you have to be very careful. They're also, they weigh 1,300 pounds and you're gonna lose most arguments if you get in an argument with them. So one of the keys to handling a stallion is to engage the horse and have that mutual respect and to, for a 170 pound human to hold on to a 1300 pound stallion 
you know, it's, you have to have their respect. And that's the most important thing so that, so that nobody gets hurt. These stallions are, they can be very dangerous. And they have their own separate fields. Uh, as I say, they're double gated. You just have to be careful. And then on their, their routine changes as winter comes and they're in a little bit more and they're preparing for the breeding season. Because about February 15th, the mares start arriving, the stallions have to be ready to perform. Um, we are a destination farm for a lot of the mares in Maryland. They'll come here and live. Uh, we'll fold their babies out. Um, gestation for a mare is 11 months, so if you're bred in February, you're going to have a foal the following January, which is challenging on a horse farm because it's, you know, 15 degrees at, at night when you're foaling these mares out. Most of them foal at night because in the wild, a mare would be careful not to foal where she's vulnerable and wolves or tigers or anything could see her. So uh, they like to foal at night and then the, in the morning, the babies are ready to move off with the herd. Um, so that's kind of the life of a thoroughbred stallion, and they live hopefully till they're in their early 20s. Um, they sort of have a little longer life than most dogs, but if you're going to be in this business for a long time, you're going to miss a few of your stallions that you started out with. Um, this horse here is um, 12 years old. We hope he lives for another 10 or 12 years because he's a very successful sire in Maryland. Now, a successful breeding season, of course, leads to foals. Josh, what about the foals? When they're born, do you see the Maryland Million in the future? Do you see the, the Maryland breeding program coming full circle? It must be a, a thrilling thing for every foal that's born. There's this uh, hopeful moment when, and I've never seen anybody not respond to it. If you watch a mare have a foal, this 130 to 140 pound creature comes into your straw and they they often aren't breathing when they're first born they're hooked to the umbilical cord and getting uh, oxygen there and there's a moment where this big baby is just laying in the straw and then just snorts and it's this life affirming thing and i, I look around often to when i've got new people that have never seen a mare foal before um, it's it's a magic moment. It's so magical that we broadcast it. We have uh, sort of like the um, like the panda cam for foals, mm -hmm. and uh, and we have people all over the world. I don't know whether they're all insomniacs or what, but they watch <laughs> babies be born and they write to us and chat with us and ask us how it's going. It's remarkable um, the the connection that people feel to horses. Fascinating. County Executive Castley, you yeah. talked, uh, you saw in the video earlier where uh, Josh's brother Mike talked about this thoroughbred training facility yeah. that's in the works. Yeah. You are a strong advocate of that being in Hartford County. Yeah. Why would that be and where do you think that should be and who's responsible for yeah. making it happen? So it's a state choice and there's been competitions around a number of counties. Um, we we uh, we're fortunate to have uh, at least one entry go in on that. It's over in Perryman. Uh, I sent a letter of support. The county council sent a letter of support. We've met with some of the folks on the decision process, but it's out of our hands. That's that's a not a decision. That's not a local decision. I know there's a lot of great, the great. You know, there's there's big competition for that. As as you as as you asked about the improvements to, to to Pimlico and the money the state's putting in there. This is just part of that whole effort to to expand to, to sort of beef up the industry breathe some life back into it. So I, I'm, I'm glad to see the state uh, recommitting back to thoroughbred horse racing. I think that's fantastic. It's not, not just because of the five to an economic multiplier that Josh was talking about, but this is, it's, it's, and it's not just part of our heritage. Uh, it's, it's fun, it's fantastic. It's such, such a, great, a great industry. And, and you, know, you, you heard Josh talking about the, 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 the foals and, and, and the, them, uh, the, the birthing process. It's 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 not it's not just like any other support like any other sport. Uh, this is the essence of life. It's it's Maryland. Uh, it's it's beautiful. It's incredible. It's part of us. And, and to to kind of bring that back into our into our state and kind of preserve what we've got, but also grow it. I think it's a it's a it's a wonderful development to do that. I'm excited. 
Josh, I hate to talk about this because it shows my age, but you almost have to be over 60 to remember some of the old tracks and that, <clears throat> that existed in Hartford County. You touched on it briefly earlier, but talk about some of those old tracks. I know you've researched them and you've been around a long time. The Hartford mm -hmm. Mall at one time was a track. Yeah, yeah, it was the Bel Air Race Track, and it was part of a five track circuit called the half milers. It was actually a little bit more than a half a mile, but it was a fair meet. And long ago, the, um, uh, the, you, you could have permission to gamble at county fairs. And so the fair circuit became very popular because it made revenue for the county. Um, and uh, the Bel Air racetrack in the 1930s often had crowds of 20,000 people. Everybody walked over to the Bel Air racetrack and had a great time. It was open for about 15 days a summer. And, uh, and, but the biggest track in Harford County was Haverty Grace. Haverty Grace was a, was a nationally recognized track. It was built in 1912 when they closed racing in New York and a lot of the big New York stables just put their horses on trains and um, sent them to Haverty Grace. Um, Alan Fair has done a beautiful job uh, putting up a bunch of murals and eight uh, equestrian statues on, in, a, in a, like a whole block area of Haverty Grace called Graw Alley. It was known as Haverty, Haverty Graw, Haverty Graw mm -hmm. in French. Um, so they called it the Graw, and it was featured in the movie The Sting. They call in the ticker tape results from Haverty Grace. Um, so it was a great, it's a great history in Harvard County. It was one of the reasons grandfather settled here. He was, uh, you know, 25 minutes from Haverty Grace and 15 minutes from Aberdeen so he could see the horse races and hop a train. And you actually recently wrote a book about the history of, of Country Life Farm, and you actually found some of that history in the very attic of the house. And we're going to take you there right now and find out a little bit more about the history of Country Life Farm. I grew up on this farm uh, in this very room. Um, three brothers had a room the size of a gymnasium uh, on the third floor, and you could get out of trouble, and you could be uh, whoever you wanted to be for the first 15 years of your life. And later in life, uh, I discovered in the basement of this house uh, the files my grandfather had carefully stored when he bought the farm in 1933, and he'd never gone back to examine them, and no one else had either. They were uh, in wooden filing cabinets, they were in busted up cardboard boxes, but they were organized um, in, a, in a disorganized fashion. I brought them all up here from the basement. It's 42 steps from the basement to the attic, and every Saturday morning I would bring up three more boxes and lay them out and examine them and begin sort of a loose uh, organization of them. Then, uh, a year or so into it, I started writing a column for a horse magazine called The Blood Horse, and it was called Letters from Rockland Farm. And that was the name of the farm in 1933 when Grandfather bought it. He changed the name to Country Life Farm because the stop on the Long Island Railroad that meant home for him was called Country Life Press. It was part of the Doubleday Printing Companies. Uh, and in those days, Long Island was very rural, so Country Life Press. Country Life Farm, it meant home to him. So uh, when I began discovering this stuff, I realized that they were in such mint condition that I needed to organize them for future generations as well, and the horse business in particular. Uh, grandfather worked for August Belmont, who was the um, of Belmont Park fame, and he was a, he was a New York banker who bred man of war. Man of War was folded in 1917. Belmont was a major in the American Expeditionary Forces in Europe. He wrote back to Grandfather, sell all the horses, we got to help the war effort. Um, so they sold Man of War as a yearling at Saratoga for $5,000. It's sort of like the Red Sox trading Babe Ruth. It's something that they always regretted, but that happens in the horse business. If you sell a horse and he goes on to do something great for someone else, it's always in the back of your mind that maybe I should have held on to that one, and Belmont certainly had that in the back of his mind. Grandfather was simply the, uh, the, the agent that sold the horse. Um, but when I found things, um, I would get tripped into rabbit holes, I guess you would call them, of 
of what the Gilded Age was like. Belmont's family were bankers um, from the Rothschild family in Europe, and I knew nothing. I, w I couldn't tell you what years the Gilded Age comprised. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting an education in it. And that's, that's what the files in the basement have taught me, how to be curious about uh, history and other people's lives. And that then became the subject matter for a book I just wrote. It was published in August. It's called Letters from Country Life. And it's, uh, it's a distillation of, of some of the strongest letters uh, the grandfather exchanged with August Belmont and with other prominent horsemen of the golden age of horse racing. But it also brings it to the present. It talks about the Pimlico redevelopment plan. It talks about uh, the challenges facing the agricultural part of the horse business in, a, in an increasingly unagricultural state. Um, so it, it's a it's a bring to date of of, of what the story the grandfather started in 1933 when he bought the farm. Fascinating history, boy. Those 42 steps felt like a thousand steps carrying those boxes of books, huh? <laughs> My goodness. Yeah, the risers to the attic are are especially high and. Nobody gets to the top without complaining oh, I'll bet. of the trek. County Executive Cassidy, who's your favorite horse? Can you think of a horse back from Preakness's past or Triple uh, well, Crowns? Mean, you know, I think for my age group, uh, Secretariat was, mm -hmm. the, was a really exciting one because we were young, and to watch this horse just take off and win races by that margin. If, if you weren't a horse, a thoroughbred horse racing fan before, Secretariat made you one. It, just, it was just too exciting and too beautiful to watch. You just... The, the, you just well, those jaw-dropping yep. things, like, this isn't even close. It's amazing. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Josh, what are the famous, some of the famous <clears throat> horses that come to mind for you and your family that uh, have a tie to Country Life Farm? Well, probably the most recognizable horse of, of some current era is Cigar. He was born at the farm in 1990, and he was Horse of the Year in 1995 and 96, and uh, he's still the leading Maryland bred earner of all time. He earned almost $10 million. He was just born on the farm. Uh, we stood a stand called Saggy, who sired Carrie back, uh, who won the 1961 Kentucky Derby in Preakness and almost won the, the Triple Crown. Um, and we've had leading sires. We s recently stood a horse called Malibu Moon, and he sired Orb, who won the 1930. Uh, 2013 uh, Kentucky Derby. Um, There's just a couple of them. Well, the, the stallion thing is critical because obviously, if you don't have stallions that can produce, so to speak, you don't have an industry. Um, what do you look for in a stallion, and how do you know uh, that, that you have a good stallion? You don't know, do you? You don't know, Mark. Um, there's this. Uh, unknown in the horse business called the run gene. Who's got the run gene? And the richest guys in the world can buy the best bred stallion in the world, but if he doesn't have that magical run gene, I mean, some of us that, you know, went to high school with big families like the Cassilies, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's this, uh, like the McGurks, the Cassilies, you play basketball against them, you better bring your A game. <laughs> um, if that happens in in a in with equines, you you've struck it rich with a good stallion. It's very, but nobody knows where they come from, so it's the great unknown, and it it's a, allows small farms like ours to compete because we might be the one that uh, hits a home run. Yeah, County Executive Castley, I'm sure you're thrilled that this yeah. is still a family operation. Absolutely. No, no corporate com corporation coming in to buy yeah. up the farm and still in Josh's family. Yeah, no, we're very proud of, of the Pons family and the legacy of Country Life Farm. I, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this, this uh, rebirth of Pimlico, you hear folks uh, to, as some of the other big race courses, uh, like uh, Keeneland and others, where it's, it's very much part of the culture to go out and have dinner at the race course and, and watch the thoroughbred horse races charging past. It's, it's, if you haven't seen it, you know, it's beautiful. It's incredible, the power, the majesty of it all. And uh, yeah, the betting's important and, and all that. The farming's important. But I, I really love to see just the majesty of horse racing return to Maryland and, and folks re-appreciate, re, re uh, grow a new appreciation for just these incredible animals. The beauty the, is really, really something to behold. So I'm, I'm hoping that's where we're headed back to in Maryland. And so it's not just gambling. 
uh, it's the entire you know life cycle of the of the thoroughbred racehorse and the majestic the majestic animals that they are. Josh, you think we're headed that way? You have a good feeling about the future of the industry? Well, there's not many industries that have a four hundred million dollar state investment. Um, they have a very competent authority that is lining up our future, um, and you know we're we're very as a as a profession, you have to be very hopeful in the horse business. You hope that every foal is going to be a really good one. They're often not, but you you have to be an optimistic person to be in the horse business. So we're optimistic about the future of Maryland racing. What about, is there a timeline, Mr. Cashley, for this training mm -hmm. facility? Is there an actual timeline when we might get a decision made on yeah, what I don't, happens? Yeah, I don't know what their final timeline is. I know they're, they're under the gun. The, the, the General Assembly reconvenes. In, in January, um, I think people, you know, anytime they're convening, you got you to gotta watch out. So <laughs> they made a decision last year. It would be nice to get that money committed before they reconvene again. I, uh, I, I'm excited by the, by the possibility. But as a former legislator, I'm always a little apprehensive about <laughs> what, what, what can happen and what can be turned. Real quickly, Josh, what's the best part of your job running that farm? What's the very best moment for you out there? I'm very lucky to be surrounded by people who love horses. Um, you know, I'm always trying to be a good manager, but um, you can't manage people if they don't enjoy their work. And everybody who shows up, our entire staff, we have a second farm over in Hyde, it's called Maryland, and there's people everywhere. And to work in the conditions that we often have to work in uh, and the the stress of that work, how hard it is physically. You have to like horses, and I, every day I show up, I feel like I'm the head ranger in some state park, and all the other rangers love their job too. Thank you Amazon. so much, both. For <laughs> thank being you, here. Mark. We it's really always yeah. the discussion. Thanks, Great to Mark. be here. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Josh. Appreciate and it. And thank yeah. you very much for watching Inside Harford County, airing exclusively on Harford TV. Please join us again next month. Thanks again on behalf of the crew, Mark Vernarelli. Thanks for watching.